you're listening right now, go ugly fucking early, man. If you're new here, just start stacking your heart out. Like, get as much Bitcoin as you fucking can. This thing is a runaway freight train, and you're not going to be able to catch it. Like, I, I bet it's, it's true for me. I bet it's true for Walker that, like, when we first got here, I should have gone so much harder. And I did go hard, but I didn't go as hard as I fucking should have. I should have gone 10 times harder. Become a crazy person. If people in your life are not showing you active disdain, you're not stacking hard enough. If you're still invited to family Thanksgiving, you're not stacking hard enough. If people are not making fun of you for brown bagging your lunch, you're not stacking hard enough. If your car is younger than Bitcoin, you're not stacking hard enough. Okay? You're, if you don't have a second job, you're not stacking hard enough. If You're just not stacking hard enough. If nobody has called you a retard, you're not stacking hard enough. <laughs> Greetings and salutations, my fellow plebs. My name is Walker, and this is the Bitcoin Podcast. The Bitcoin time chain is 833159, and the value of one Bitcoin is still one Bitcoin. Today's episode is Bitcoin Talk, where I talk with my guest about Bitcoin and whatever else comes up. Today, that guest needs no introduction. It's the man, the myth, the meme, American Hodel. It's a fucking great conversation, and you're going to enjoy it, so listen to it. That's all I've got to say by way of an introduction. Before we dive in, if you like the Bitcoin Podcast, please share an episode you find valuable on Noster, Twitter, or even Facebook if you're still using that. I'm a one-man show trying to build out another fucking Bitcoin podcast, and the best way you can support this show is to share it with your friends, family, and of course, strangers on the internet. You can also support this show by going to bitbox.swiss slash walker and using the promo code walker for 5% off the fully open source Bitcoin only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. As always, you can watch the video version of this episode on Rumble, YouTube, or X by searching at Walker America or listen on found.fm or wherever you get your podcasts by searching for the Bitcoin podcast. And if you listen to the Bitcoin podcast on Fountain, which I recommend, Consider giving this show a boost or creating a clip of something you found valuable. Lastly, if you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, hit me up on social media or through the website bitcoinpodcast.net. Without further ado, let's get into this Bitcoin talk with American Hodel. Dude, thanks for coming on. What a uh, what an auspicious time to be doing this too. I know, man. It's f fucking. You know what? Though I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm not excited. Like I, I just feel like somebody stole my shit, and the cops gave me back most of it. But there's still like some. I'm rifling through shit, and there's some things missing. You know what I mean? That's how I feel. I let's explore those feelings a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, how does feeling like that make you feel? Uh, you know, well. Walker, I think it all comes down to when I was on the playground uh, as a small child and I would look at the other <laughs> small children and I would say to myself, these people are fucking losers. They don't they don't own any Bitcoin. So, you know, I'm the only base child here. Uh, Man, <laughs> I can see how that would have been traumatic as an early experience. <laughs> also, that's that's probably going to be the legitimate experience of this first like Generation B uh, group of Bitcoiners that are now like you know, they're like little babies now. Like I got a, we got a little baby upstairs now. He's a, he's a cool little dude, you know, Yeah. Uh, first one. And it's like wild, like that, that kid, I, I'm still trying to figure out like, huh, how much, like, you know, the whole, like, don't tell anybody, you know, if somebody asks you how much Bitcoin you have, it's like, well, not right, enough, right. you know, I think I'm probably going to adopt that approach with the kid too. Like, I'm gonna be like, listen, you know, if you, if you, have, you know, daddy, how much Bitcoin do you have? Like, well, not enough, son, never enough but doing my best to stack more. Like, I think when they're young, that's a good approach. But as they get older, uh, I'm, 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 I'm very in favor of preparing children for the responsibility of wealth. So around when they're about 10 or 11, you don't want a, like a six-year-old blabbing, like blowing the OPSEC on the playground. Right. But once, and, once they're uh, old enough, mature enough to handle it, then I think it's it's totally appropriate to like, yeah, you know, this is a big responsibility that is going to be dropped on them one day, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. Like that's you know, yeah. There's there's definitely probably like a prime age because you don't want like li little Timmy's dad going and getting his wrench and being like, I'm gonna go, you know, <laughs> yeah. fuck up this guy. <laughs> uh, 
But that's what guns are for, right? So, you know, fuck I had you, a Timmy, proud moment, Timmy's dad. I uh, had a proud moment the other day. My daughters were fighting over – I have a Bitcoin blanket in my office, and they were fighting over who got to be under the Bitcoin blanket. And it was wow. like, I want the Bitcoin I want the Bitcoin blanket. And I was like, you know what? I'm raising them right over here. You know? That's beautiful. Man, that's <laughs> that, that's beautiful. It's uh, – uh, well, I was going to ask you how old they are, but I don't want to uh, dox any. They're uh, young. Uh, yeah, okay. Young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's awesome though. I'm uh, this, our first one here, uh, little little Apollo, and uh, so far, you know, he's a uh, he's he's a joy, man. It's like that that blend of like, man, and you're fucking exhausted, yeah. But, like you're just really fucking happy, and also you have this new fire under your ass. That's like, I need to fucking build and build and build, but also, yep. you know, I'm I want to build so that I can also be present. So I want to build in a way that allows me to do that. And yeah, like, I mean I that that's the balance, right? You you're really not you're really not a man until either one of two things happens or both things happen, which is your father dies or you have uh, you know, children, right? And it, until you have children, you're you're kind of just a big child yourself. And you know, I'm sure you can experience like appreciate this as like a new parent, but like Absolutely. Me and my wife were talking about this the other day. We were like, what the fuck did we even do before kids? We would like sit around all day and like we'd go to the gym in the morning. Then we'd like play on our phones. We'd be like, I'm bored. What do you want to do? You want to like get food or something? Like you want to go to Chipotle? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm so tired. You know, it's like, yeah. what, you, what, yeah, like, what were we what doing? Was that? It was nothing. No, it, it's so true. It's like you, you know, and not that like I, every, every year of my life is the, is the best one yet, you know, cause I'm still alive. And that's beautiful. And I've got an amazing wife that I'm still not quite sure how I landed. It's one of those things where it's just like, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Like, don't fuck this up, man. <laughs> but then you, you're like, you're absolutely right. Like, it's only been a couple of months and we're, we're both just like, man, you know, you hear about friends that are like, you know, out doing whatever. And you're like, you know, that sounds, that sounds fucking hollow and kind of pointless. Yeah. Um, huh. I'm really happy we're doing this and have this little human now that is, you know, joining our crew like it's a it's a powerful thing it puts things in perspective for you too totally Kinda makes I mean, the whole bitcoin thing like dude, way fucking more it. important too think think about it like think about all the war and famine and pestilence and rape and murder and starvation and floods and like fucking every slavery everything that every one of our ancestors had to go through in order for you to be here now and for you to you know, say I'm I'm going to reject the the blockchain of humanity so that I can focus on hedonism and my own pleasures in these fleeting moments. Uh, how could it feel anything other than hollow and empty? Of course, it's hollow and empty because because it is. You know, Man, like like have you, have you seen those uh, those videos like the the we're dinks like uh, dual yeah, income I no that, kids. I hate that First of all, video. like just calling it dink is like so fucking funny. It's like <laughs> okay, like well, <laughs> yeah. you, you indeed you are dinks. Um, but the other part is just like. You see the stuff that they put in these videos and it's like, we can, you know, go to Europe like on a whim. And it's like, all right, cool. Um, yeah. You know, like we, we can eat whatever we want and stay up late. It's like, all right, well, I mean, I don't know. Baby's not stopping me from eating whatever the fuck I want, but like, whatever. Okay. You do like all this stuff that they're listing. You're like, ah, oh, you guys are like, there's a lot of cope involved. And like, if that's genuinely what makes you happy, fine. I don't give a fuck what you do. Like yeah. I, freedom of choice, choose, live however you want. But I can't imagine, like the the whole like like you said, so many fucking ancestors went through genuine shit for us to exist at this really unique place in time and space, where things are actually pretty fucking good. Like yeah, there's a lot of fucked up shit in the world, always has yeah. been, but overall things are pretty fucking great. And you're like, yeah, I'm gonna honor my ancestors uh, by ending you know, their ancestry. Like we're just stopping it here, right? With my generation, no more. And, uh, you know, the thing, the whole, like, uh, well, for, we were not having kids for the planet is like the ultimate cope. It's like, you really just wanted to somehow get out of it so much that you're like, well, if I don't have kids, the planet will be saved. And it's like, well, right. What, what's the fucking point of the planet without yeah. sentient beings to experience it? Man? No, I'm on, I dude, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more with you. I'm on team people. Um, I'm a human supremacist. If I see a robot, I kick it. I have a robot vacuum. I kick it every day. I say, what's up, bitch? Who's in charge? Who's your master? You know, just to let it know who's boss for when they rise up. Uh, but for me, it's just like, yeah, what is the planet if it's not for people? We're going to leave it to ants? Who gives a shit? 
what the ants or the monkeys or the fucking zebras do. No one can, it's for us. The whole planet is us. We have dominion over the whole fucking thing. All right? Like, maybe that's too much Sunday school from when I was little or whatever, but, like, I still very firmly believe that. We're going to let porpoises run this planet? No. That's not how things F work. Fucking manatees coming in here? I don't know. <laughs> manatees seem like they would be kind of, like, they would be pretty high up on, like, the... I, it's a weird, you know, you it's know, a the weird, um, it's a weird pagan cult, really. It's, like, the atheists mm -hmm. are actually, they're not atheists, they're pagans. And, you know, basically it's, like, Mother Gaia is their, is their new god. And, you know, it's, like... That's a weird god to have, man. I mean, and these are the same Malthusians who will say things like, you know, I wish there was only 500 million people on the planet. It's like, okay, in one breath, you just made yourself the, the good person because you like grass or something, but you just talked about the murder of 8 billion people like it was nothing. Fuck you. We are not on the same team at, at all. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't understand how you can think this in this manner, you know? I think it's like this, it's ultimately like just a huge uh, projection of deep feelings of inadequacy and hopelessness that you're like, well, I felt like it just comes in like, I fucking hate my life. And so, you know what, you know, I'm going to make myself feel better a little bit by trying to seem somehow above others by saying that us humans, we are the problem with this planet and we need to be, you know, eradicated and brought down to whatever sustainable population levels. And it's like, fucking a, like, what do you think? Like the point of all of this is like, what do you what, like? Yeah. What, what genuinely? What do you think? Like, because yeah, we are fucking animals too, but like we're fucking highly intelligent animals that evolved the capacity to pass down knowledge. There, there's like, there's two schools of thought, right? There there's uh, anarcho primitivism, which says we're going back to Georgia Guidestones, five hundred million people. Uh, we're all gonna like you know I don't know ride bicycles instead of using combustion engines or something. And then there's <laughs> Kardashev type one, type two, you know, we're, we're going up the Kardashev scale and we're going to have trillions of human beings across infinite galaxies. And I mean, of those two, which, which one is more pro-life? Uh, like, like, okay, think about it. Like the, the one, the Malthusian one where you reduce population, you, you're getting less. Yeah, sure. You're getting less negative things, but you're also getting less of everything that's amazing about humanity. You know, you're less Mozart, Mozart's, less Einstein's, less Beethoven's, you know, like, Whereas in the trillions of worlds example, like, you know, you just have humans all over the whole, the whole galaxy and into neighboring galaxies. There are trillions of Einsteins. There are trillions yeah. of Mozarts. There are trillions of the, the people, the spark of life that makes, you know, I mean, listen, the, people say, like, I love science. And they're, like, talking about, like, you know, I don't know, a picture of a nebula or something they saw on Facebook or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't give a f two fucks about a nebula. Okay, the most interesting thing that exists is us. We're the most interesting thing that exists. There's nothing more interesting than we are. All right, that's how it is. You know, so like yeah. to just extinguish life or treat it so cavalier or carelessly in this manner, uh, as if you know better because what you you're 130 IQ. That's nothing. That's fucking nothing compared to the mass of humanity. It's like I get it. You're and smart. You're rich. You're whatever. But that's not realistically. They're probably like yeah. a 125 IQ or like a 120, and they think <laughs> that, and they think yeah, they're like a 130, 130. 35. Yeah, I mean they're they're mid curve. Let's be honest, they're mid curve. Like yeah, yeah. that's that 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 is a 120 is the most annoying IQ uh, yeah. range because they they know just enough to be fucking irritating, but n yeah. they don't have enough meta awareness to know how irritating they are. You know. It's, it's it's like the, the consultant worst. class of IQs, and I say that as somebody yes. who worked in consulting for a little while. Like that's like the mm -hmm. consultant class of IQs. Like you it just is. you think you're. It, it's like uh, like Dunning Kruger to the max at like the 120 IQ, where you like you really think you're kind of an expert on stuff, but you kind of have no fucking clue. I, um, I've said then, it's like yeah. being a football coach, you know, where it's like <laughs> you're just smart enough to win at football, but just stupid enough to realize devoting your life to football is retarded. You know, <laughs> it's like. Great, you uh, foot You're great at football, man. That's cool. Good for you, dude. Bill Belichick. Yeah. <laughs> this feels like it might have been a personal uh, attack on Bill Belichick. <laughs> I man. like Bill Belichick. All right. Sure, sure. Yeah, whatever, whatever you say, man. <laughs> oh man. Well, like speaking of uh, of mid IQs, um, and not that IQ should be. Not that I'm judging anyone for how they're brain functions again i'm a i'm an i'm an equal opportunity uh well how did i, I was gonna say equal opportunity hater but i don't really hate hating is too much like it takes too much energy and time it's just like a waste right but i was thinking just of 
how much seething cope there is right now mm. as we start to see Bitcoin run up. And like, I haven't, I haven't been around very long with this. Like for me, I didn't start stacking until 2020. Um, like, so it's been, this is basically like I had kind of the beginning of that cycle. Like, you know, the, the nice flash crash down during COVID and then it starts running up and it's like, wow, this is wild. And the, this double top and things are crazy. And just then this long arduous, what I, what felt like a long arduous bear market of again, relentless stacking, because I was like, well, this is like, I've got a chance here. You know, I wasn't around in the early days. Like this is, you know, I'm just going to work hard, keep my nose to the grindstone and try to stack some sats. But now things are getting like, there's this euphoric feeling again, uh, which I felt like I only got a glimpse of before, but I, it feels more like, uh, from my side anyway, it's like more of this like calmer Zen than euphoria. Cause it's kind of like, ah, okay. Things are happening as, as we sort of expected them to. Okay. This feels good. But then there's this whole other, like I, I'm wor genuinely worried about Peter Schiff's mental health. Like I, <laughs> I, I don't know if he's, if he's going to make it like in multiple ways, but like, I mean, you've been around for a few, a few cycles now, like you've seen yeah. the comings and the goings. What, like, do you have some advice for folks that are like, maybe tack, maybe they just started stacking at mm. you know, 58 K last time. And now we've just blown, right? Like we just skipped right over 58 K basically. Like, yeah. What's the, what's the advice? Like, what's the the mentality that you need to have to to maintain sanity and composure? I think the biggest advice that I could give, having gone through it myself, is that uh, everybody wants you to lose, and everybody's against you, and it doesn't matter how much loyalty you have to the person, how close you think you are to the person. I'm talking about very close friends and family. I'm not talking about people on Twitter. I'm talking about the people in your in your real life who should be in your corner who you will find out quickly are not in your corner. Because what happens as you become successful is your success holds a mirror up to those around you and you become a reminder of the risks that they did not take. And even if they were initially supportive of you taking those risks, they were doing so under the, you know, preconception that you were going to lose, that you were about to lose. They thought you were about to become lower status than them. And then when you became higher status than them, it, it, it doesn't feel good for them anymore, especially if you were the guy or the girl who was talking about Bitcoin, you know, incessantly uh, while it was at the lows. So I, what I would what I would say is like expect the people that are supposed to be happy for you not to be happy for you and expect to find yourself alone. Maybe that's not the best answer, but that's the truth <laughs> of what you're facing. And then you have to say to yourself, OK. I've built up a lot of dead wood around me in terms of relationships for people who I was loyal to who are now actively disloyal to me, and now I have to, I have to deal with that. That's the reality of what I have to deal with. And how do I deal with all of this excess wood I have around me? Do I pick it up and carry it? Do I carry the weight of everyone? Do I sit here in inertia and just deal with it? Or do I set the whole fucking thing ablaze and do I move forward without any baggage, right? And like, you will come to that conclusion on your own and what's appropriate for you. Everybody's gonna have a different, you know, a different emotional answer, but dude, they don't, they don't want us to win. They don't want you to win. They don't want me to win. They want you to be a loser forever. But now you're not, like now you're a winner and you have to deal with the consequences of winning, you know? Fuck man, I mean, I'm just speaking of wood, like this price action. Oh, wow. Um, but I don't think that's the kind of wood you were talking about, but no, I think that's actually, that's pretty fair advice. Like, I mean, nothing kind of gives you a window into who your like true friends are and who's actually with, you know, with you to be your real friend, like getting some modicum of success. Uh, like, yeah. especially I think, you know, for a lot of us, like we probably have a lot of friends, you know, in like TradFi and, you know, cause fucking, there's so many fucking people in finance these days. Right. Uh, and, and that's particularly like this, uh, this industry where because they were and are still the experts of their given domain, often they've been some of the most reticent to, uh, to heed the warnings of Bitcoiners, uh, whether that be online or like, you know, your actual friends, I, I've got to hand it to a few of my, my boys though, who are like deep in TradFi 
and have genuinely like dug into Bitcoin big time after like many, you know, late night debates over a lot of beers. Uh, they, you know, eventually were like, okay, I'll look into this and like more power to them because for a lot of those folks in that industry, that's not the case. And like, you see this right now, like on Twitter, you see all of these, like whatever finance guru, savings expert, dividend pro guys who are like just losing their minds right now as Bitcoin just does what Bitcoin does. And it, I mean, it's gotta be a little bit hard. Like, man, I would, I would hate to be a financial advisor right now who's been like had clients asking about Bitcoin and has been telling them like, no, no, that's not a, not what I would recommend for an investment. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, get yourself some SPX and some, uh, some, you know, some nice, uh, cash producing, uh, cash producing dividend stocks. And that's, that'll, that'll get you set up well. And meanwhile, Bitcoin's just ripping like, yeah, I don't know. There's a reckoning that, that has to come, I think. And oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I was thinking about, uh, this is a little bit off topic from, you know, it's go anyway, man. There's no rules. Part, but like I was thinking about MSTR today and mm -hmm. essentially like why MSTR is pumping so hard recently. And then I was thinking about the flywheel that happens when sailor gets into the S and P 500. So like sailor gets into the S and P 500 um, and all of this dumb money, this fiat money, that's just zombified these passive flows that are walking into index portfolios are now buying up SPY or whatever. And that money is going directly into Sailor's hands in the form of share price. And he could do a dilution against it to capture the spread between that and hard money. So he takes the, the zombified dumb money that's walking in, he transfers it into hard money. The long-term holders of MSTR, like myself, have been holding it since he announced. They basically come, uh, you know, they, they understand that this is like an Amazon no profit for 20 years model and that we're going to all get more Bitcoin per share as we go along if we just let Sailor continue to do this and zombie attack the passive flows. How, how if you're from the TradFi world and you don't have the Bitcoin lens that, you know, me and you have, how are you going to see that? Because I can see that and it's obvious to me. How are you going to see that? Because you're still, your denominator is still USD. You're still not thinking in Bitcoin. I haven't like I've said this before, but Bitcoin is like a language. It's like, a you know, language is an OS for the human mind, right? You have uh, a new baby at home, right? And as that baby gets older, that baby is going to learn language and language is an unlock for the environment. And, you know, they're going to realize they can say da da ball and then you bring them a ball, you know, uh, you they can say da da food, whatever. And you bring them food, right? Uh, whereas when you take them into like a store for the first time at Target or something, they're going to learn that all the things that they want there cost money. And then they start to learn a second language, and that's the language of money. So Bitcoin's an OS for the human mind. It's an operating system upgrade uh, in terms of the language of money. And people that have this operating system upgrade, they're, they're thinking in this language and speaking this language to each other. They're vastly outperforming people who have the old, you know, just standard USD language, right? So, like, how long does it take for the world to upgrade and figure out that that's what's actually going on? Because to me, somebody who can, who's bilingual in both of these languages... I can see I can see things immediately that are not, you know, eminently clear to others. And and that's the opportunity, by the way. No, it's I mean, it really is amazing. I think what's most incredible about this, the whole sailor saga, like, first of all, that like, you know, some of those his older tweets resurfaced, uh, you know, from like, whatever, like 2013 or 2014, when he was like, I think Bitcoin's like going, you know, like this is its last hurrah or something. And honestly, more power and respect to him for coming from that point of view, then deciding I'm going to fucking educate myself. And then I think, you know, going deeper down the rabbit hole than many thought it was humanly possible to do. And now being just taking it to the extreme and saying, well, I'm going to use the instruments of this broken fiat system to acquire as much Bitcoin as I can and make my company incredibly valuable by doing so. And I'm going to do it all by the book. And I'm also going to tell everybody every step of the way. I'm not trying to do this behind the scenes. I'm doing it out in the open. And like, here's my playbook. You can copy it. Yeah. And, and still now we just don't see too really any copycats, uh, that are like outside it's, of just no, the no. Bitcoin industry. Like MSTR is a one and done. We were talking about this the other day. It's like, first of all, I don't think he's really speculative attacking the dollar the same way people have been saying he is. I think he's speculative attacking the, the U S stock market and the passive flows. I think, I think that's what he's doing which is fucking genius. And I, you know, it finally clicked for me like a few years later, but think about it. If you're, let's say you're like one of these zombie companies, like MSTR was, uh, was nothing. None of us had ever heard of it. 
We didn't know what it was. MSTR was nothing. None of us had ever heard of it before Michael Saylor announced that he bought Bitcoin. So it was basically a zombie company, like a, like a GameStop or an AMC or something, yeah. right? So let's say you're another one of these zombie companies and you take the MST mo- MSTR model and you try and take your free cash flows into Bitcoin. What are you going to get your hands on? 2,000 Bitcoin, maybe? How does that compare to Michael Saylor's 200,000 Bitcoin? Like, no, you're not going to be able to catch him. This is a one and done. He's about to make it into the S&P 500 where he can perform the vampire attack of all vampire attacks on the passive flows. I mean, dude, it's like it's game over. It's going to be one of the most pot watching that stock climb its way up the S&P 500 chart in into being one of the five most valuable companies in the world and potentially the most valuable company in the world is going to be one of the craziest things we've ever witnessed. And it's going to rewrite everybody's perception of what is going on, you know. And so I'm not saying you should be 100% MSTR allocator or something. I'm not. Uh, but, you know, maybe you have a little bit in your retirement account or whatever. And, and also, it's the story. It's the story of the world's, potentially the world's most profitable company in the future will be a company that just holds Bitcoin. That, that'll destroy people's minds, you know. It, it, it really is incredible, too. And, like, the fact that he's also, because you're right, I had not, I didn't know what MicroStrategy was or did until he started accumulating Bitcoin. And it's like, you look at, okay, like enterprise software and say, okay, you know, whatever. But now he's like, okay, we're also going to build, we're going to build out solutions on Bitcoin and lightning. And we're going to, we're going to take, you know, a little bit of our workforce and dedicate their time to that as we're accumulating the hardest money that humans have ever discovered. Yep. And so they've got such a, I think you're right in the one-off because I mean, unless unless like Google or Apple or one of these, you know, giants decides like, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to put $20 billion into Bitcoin. But I just, I have a hard time seeing them doing that. I I just, I think it's outside of their playbook. That's just not something that like, that they have the capacity or the willpower to do. And he, Michael Saylor is going to go down like that is going to be the case study of all case studies. Like, yeah. look what this company did and look how it affected their performance. And like, good on you if you were holding some because you were getting uh, a little bit of extra kickback on top of Bitcoin. Because now, I mean, that's the beauty of it. People are like, oh, well, you know, he's going to dilute the shares more, you know, to, to buy more Bitcoin. It's like, yeah, to buy more Bitcoin, to give you a higher amount of Bitcoin per share than you had before. Yeah. Like, that's really the only number that matters there is doesn't matter how many shares he issues. Do you have more or less Bitcoin per share? That's what it comes down to. Like that's that's the value prop basically. In addition to having a profitable business on the side, like so it's it's honestly a beautiful thing. Like, yeah. I, you know, I don't have uh, don't have a lot of stocks. I'm I've gone fairly deep uh, into Bitcoin, but MicroStrategy is one of the few that I do because that's something that I can actually uh, sink my teeth into. And uh, and yeah, it's a uh, it's fucking beautiful to watch it though. To watch it's, just it's these the one, brains one-off. melt too. Yeah, seeing it happen. It, he's a he's a one off in terms of companies, and we are a one off in terms. We're talking about ancestry. Like think of the long the blockchain of humanity that you exist at. Well, by luck or by happenstance or by divine provenance, like you are at the cornerstone of the changing of money from analog to digital. That's a big fucking deal. It's a big deal because really fiat to me is a, a blip. It's nothing. It's an error code. Like yeah. fiat is, is shad. It's on the running on the fumes of the gold standard. Really humanity has two monies. It has gold for 5,000 years and then it has Bitcoin digital gold for the next 5,000 years. And by sheer dumb luck or by, you know what I mean? Divinity. We happen to be at the precipice of this changeover and nobody knows that it's happening except for the people that are here. And the number one question that every millennial's grandchildren are going to ask them is, why didn't you buy Bitcoin? What were you doing? How, how did you not see this? But of course, they won't be able to see it because it's only the, the crazy people like us who can see it, you know, for now. Eventually, maybe like after this bull run gets going and it's a million dollars a coin and MicroStrategy is one of the most profitable companies in the world and blah, 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 blah. It becomes really hard to ignore it at that point. Like, I think I just read on Twitter at $200,000 of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is more profitable than every company in the S&P 500. Like Bitcoin has a higher market cap than every company in the S&P 500. So Bitcoin outweighs Apple Computer, Saudi Aramco, Exxon, Coca-Cola, etc. You can't ignore that. It's impossible, you know.
If you want to keep your Bitcoins in the long haul so your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren can benefit from it, you need to keep it safe. So head to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use promo code walker for 5% off the Bitcoin-only Bitbox O2 hardware wallet. Then get your Bitcoin off the exchange and into your own self-custody. The Bitbox O2 is easy as hell to use whether you are totally new to Bitcoin or a seasoned psychopath. It's Bitcoin only, and it is fully open source. You can head to their GitHub and check for yourself. There is no need to trust me. When you go to bitbox.swiss slash walker and use promo code walker, not only do you get 5% off, but you also help support another fucking Bitcoin podcast. This one. So thank you. And I mean, that's the thing. We've got this this confluence of factors right now where you have you have just these these four-year cycles, these having cycles that are going to happen no matter what. And we can look back at the fairly short history of Bitcoin and see what has happened in the past and know that, you know, if we just take like the most fucking basic economics ever, which is supply and demand, that we've got an ever increasing demand and a finite supply, which is exponentially decreasing in new issuance every four years until it's completely zero. And that's that's happening no matter what, right? But then on top of that, you've got the fact that, well, fuck, we've got these ETFs now, which like them or not, whether you view them you know, as Bitcoin is the Trojan horse into Wall Street through these ETFs or vice versa, Wall Street is Trojan, Trojan horsing their way into Bitcoin through the ETFs, whatever. It, it's just a huge fucking amount of money that's flowing in now. Right. And that is on top of all the fucking psychopathic stackers who are just DC, you know, daily DCAing little little bit every day and just have said it and forget it and that's going to keep on happening and then they smash by when they feel like it. This is this is my I'm I'm giving away my secret strategy here of DCA a little bit of money and then smash by when I'm feeling frisky. But like all of that just keeps accumulating and the having's coming up now and the funny thing is that like I I I've only gotten like one reach out from normie land so far uh same so okay one. i've had one yeah. i was gonna ask you so it's it feels like we're just we're not even at this isn't even hype yet like this this is still just like before people realize there's hype and once that starts happening it's like man the bitcoin new supply issuance is getting cut in half no matter what and nobody's gonna stop that and there's only gonna be a few bitcoin coming out every day and boy things are going to get really fucking wild plus we've got this you know global election year i think it's like 50 different countries are having elections so everybody's going to be all the central bankers are under pressure to like ease up monetary conditions because i think what people also forget is like this past what year and a half or so we've had the greatest monetary tightening like relatively speaking pretty much in in fiat history yeah. Like the like the M two went down. Like it, this is we shrank the amount of yep. money in the system. We pulled liquidity out, and during that time, Bitcoin's also ripping in petrodollar value. So what happens when they you know start warming those printers back up again, and things start like it's going to get fucking nuts. And By I don't way, think people like it's going to get crazy. It's hilarious that like everybody told me that can't happen with Bitcoin. Bitcoin can't go up in a high rate mm -hmm. environment it's like well here we are stupid how you feel now do you feel dumb you look dumb you know like, <laughs> like come on man i mean yeah. bitcoin is is a, a host unto itself okay you trying to slot bitcoin bitcoin is alien technology you trying to slot bitcoin into your stupid worldview it doesn't it doesn't exist in your stupid worldview it is larger than your frame of reference all right so like anytime you think you know what the fuck is about to happen here you don't know shit None of us know shit. And the best thing you can do is humble yourself, right? You got to stay humble, stack sats. And you know what I mean? It's like, I, dude, it's frustrating to do. It's so frustrating. I'm thinking of like three people in, in specific who just annoy the shit out of me. Um, <laughs> everybody's so wildly confident about what's going to happen here. And it's like, you know, like one thing we were talking about is like uh, all time high before the halving, right? That's mm -hmm. never happened before. We were talking about this during the bear market when we was at 15K because what do Bitcoiners know? The number one thing that Bitcoin is going to do is the thing that it's never fucking done before, right? 
And what has it never done before? All time high before the happen. We're ju- we're about to do it. We're we're not there yet, but like it's coming soon. Everybody can see it. Um, so I mean, yeah, just you gotta have an extreme amount of humility to fucking play this game, man. You can't think that you know how the world works because the world works differently now. I, I think one of the mistakes I made originally with Bitcoin was thinking, yeah, Bitcoin's gonna go to a million dollars or Bitcoin's gonna go to ten million dollars or whatever. And that the world will be the same, just with Bitcoin at a million dollars. And then, I, you know, I've been here almost 10 years now, and I look back and I think, God damn it, the world is so fucking different. It's so crazy how much the world has shifted in only, in only 10 years, you know, and it's going to shift even harder the next 10, likely. Like, it feels like we're in some sort of a early 1900s era where, like, you know, the aristocrats still have control of, like, the legacy institutions, but technology is at the gates and all you need is like the powder keg of World War One to set off this wave of, uh, you know, enlightenment across Europe. And like, yeah, that's where we're at right now across the entire world. And the times there are they are changing. You know what I mean? It's like digital transformation is so rapid and so, yeah, just it just it's earth shaking. It's earth shattering. So for you to think you know what's going to happen because you have an econ degree, fuck, fuck <laughs> off. You don't know shit, you know? Nobody does. Yeah, it's... I don't know, it's... uh, I think humans are generally really bad at anticipating uh, rate of change. Yes. Like, we can can often see that that a change is coming, but we are, even the best among us, are very poor judges of how quickly that change happens and how quickly it propagates. And those changes are typically technology driven as you were kind of getting at, like these technology is what drives these revolutions because it's, it forces change on people who were not going to make those changes voluntarily. And usually those people are the old guard, the entrenched power structures, and it allows for a new class uh, to emerge who is open to these changes because they say, well, you know what? This current fucking system kind of sucks for the majority of people and I don't really like it. So we're going to do something different. And yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to profit off it because I'm seeing it before these old farts do. And like, this is, you know, this just keeps on happening and it's going to be really, uh, I, 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 I always struggle with the idea of like, you know, people talk about uh, like hyper Bitcoinization and, and what that looks like and when it's going to happen. And people thinking, you know, like the world will be on this Bitcoin standard, like, you know, within, you know, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it might be. I struggle with the timelines for those, but then I have to, I have to check myself and say, well, you know what, Walker, you're probably pretty fucking bad at guessing how quickly things could change. Mm. Like that's, that's the thing. And I, I see I, I'm very interested by what different sovereign nations are doing with regard to Bitcoin. Like I was talking with, with Samson about this because he's like re- very tapped into that. And you see, you know, all these uh, speculations about like, okay, is, is Oman now the going to be the big sovereign buyer right. uh, of, of Bitcoin because they were, they were in Madeira and they were in El Salvador before that. And like, well, it looks like it, but like, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on how this game theory of sovereign nations realizing, mm, fuck, maybe it's a good idea to get some of this Bitcoin thing in case it catches on, like yeah. how that starts playing out. Because like we're, right now the US government is sitting on like a micro strategy size or no, they have, wait, the US government has like, I think what, 200,000 Bitcoin, something like that, that they've seized between Bitfinex, the Bitfinex hack and a couple other things. I think it's something like that. I think most of it is not in their possession anymore, though, isn't it? Okay. I, I don't know. I'm not up to date on this, but usually I, I saw, they, they get rid of it pretty quickly. I think that they've they've brought in, uh, I'll, I'll have to double check this, but I'm pretty sure they brought in a bunch more, like took it out of the hackers' uh, like, you know, wallets uh, and are now in possession of it. And they're probably debating right now, like, because I think it's the U.S. Marshal Service who's in control of that for whatever reason. Like, what do we do with all this Bitcoin? And it's like, well, boy, you should really just, uh, just keep it. Yeah. Really, just hold keep the it. fuck onto that, I know. and and probably print. I was talking with uh, with Pierre Richard, and he was like, "Why is the U.S. government not just printing dollars to buy Bitcoin? There's, it'd be ridiculous to sell Bitcoin for dollars when they can just yeah. create them for free. Like that's just stupid." But what are you? Uh, 
I don't know. What's your take on that? How do you, what are you looking for amongst these sovereigns? Like, do you think we're going to start to see the scramble this year? Is there going to be like a, mm. a big coming out of the woodwork of sovereigns being like, you know what, actually we're super pro Bitcoin Bitcoiners move here. Uh, bring us, you know, bring your money here, spend your money here. And we are super Bitcoin friendly and we're buying Bitcoin because Fiat's a melting ice cube. And we realize that now. I don't yeah, know. I would imagine that the sovereign wealth funds will be taking large positions this time around, especially since it's now an institutional grade asset, right? Um, you also have to consider the fact that like, why does the US still have gold in Fort Knox? You know, we haven't been on the gold standard since uh, 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window. So why do we still have gold in Fort Knox? The reason is because they're uh, why is why is China stacking gold? Why is Russia stacking gold? The reason is because in the event of a monetary reset under a shadow gold standard, which is the fiat standard, if there was to be, uh, you know, a sit down at a table, the amount of gold that you hold is going to define who, you know, who you are and what your size is in the new world order. And I think the same thing is true of Bitcoin, especially as Bitcoin demonetizes gold. So at some point in this, I, I'm, I believe, listen, this is bullish, but I believe that we're going to decapitate gold this cycle. I think that's going to happen, right? We're going to fucking cut the head off gold and be like, who's next? The euro? You want some? You know what I mean? That's what we're, that's where we're headed. And uh, once we demonetize gold, you now have to look at your gold in Fort Knox or wherever it's kept in China and say, is this still the insurance policy I, I thought it was? And if the answer is no, then you have to have its replacement as the new insurance policy or at least in tandem to the old insurance policy. So that's that's what I believe is happening game theoretically. And like which nations are stacking, who's doing what? I don't know, it's so opaque. We we don't we won't know until we know, right? Um but I mean, the El Salvador El Salvador is going to get some company shortly here, I believe. Yeah. No, it's a uh... gold uh I I almost feel bad like cuz we silver just got decapitated today, right? Yeah. That that was officially like this is silver has been used as money for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, yep. it, it died. It died as a, uh, as a money a little bit before gold, you know, gold killed silver. And then now Bitcoin has, uh, has overtaken that market cap. I, I don't know. I've seen like recently some like big silver bulls on Twitter, which I just don't understand. I don't understand anyone who's like, yeah, silver is the, that's where you should put your money these days. I'm like, are you, are you fucking stupid? Like I, I just, okay. The, the answer is yes, they are stupid. Fuck. Extremely stupid. It's my I was talking to a friend about, he, he was telling me, I was saying, you know, holding Bitcoin is so hard emotionally and blah, blah, blah. And he was saying, I think, I think gold, I think holding gold is just as hard emotionally. I was like, no. And I'll tell you why. It's because when you hold Bitcoin, you go from being a winner to a loser, to a winner, to a loser, to a winner, to a loser. That's emotionally difficult because you're going high status, low status, high status, low status. Okay. Uh, when you invest in gold, you're just a loser and it's just all low status down here. So you never have the high of like, oh my God, this is amazing. No, every day you just wake up and be like, this sucks. I'm a loser. I buried all my money in the backyard, you know? <laughs> yeah, this, uh, we've just, uh, we've just broken into the psyche of Peter Schiff right there. Like, that's, yeah, exactly. It, it's got, I mean, I guess that's why he sells it probably. Uh, and, and isn't, uh, isn't holding as much of it, but I don't know. It, it's, I, I'm very, uh, I'm very optimistic about the future because of Bitcoin. And I think this is the case for many Bitcoiners and it's kind of this like really refreshing thing because when you spend more, the more time you spend around Bitcoiners and the more time you spend learning about Bitcoin, uh, and even, you know, not just Bitcoin Twitter, but like Noster now, like that is this like wonderful, positive place where people are actively building these solutions just day in and day out that are like making people's lives better by giving us more freedom uh, and more, uh, more moving along that sovereignty uh, curve. And then you, uh, you find your way back to like normie Twitter occasionally, or like, you know, the part yeah. of Twitter that's like still yeah. masking. Um, that's like, I, I just got my ninth booster and I was triple masked and I somehow got COVID and you're like, there are still people like this out there. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah. Like sometimes you find your way back into, into the, the different normie bubbles and you're like, Oh fuck. We are really so early still because there's like people are like mentally unwell across a lot of the world and they're just still really broken by the last time, like 
I, I think COVID broke a lot of people, like really, really yeah. broke them mentally. And there's no coming back from that for a lot of people. And I have a feeling that the governments of the world, not necessarily uh, colluding together in any way, but just because they're going to do what they each want to do in a kind of totalitarian minded way, there's going to be some new uh, big threat, right? There's always a new threat. There's always a new crisis. And these wars that we have raging on multiple fronts that are proxies for America's military industrial complex, I don't think they're quite getting the crisis mode activated that uh, those who are orchestrating them wanted to see. And so I feel like we were due for another large crisis of sorts. Mm. Uh, and that is, uh, I, I guess I would be more worried about that uh, if I if I wasn't aware of all the great tools that are being built, because you know that what's going to come hand in hand with that is the same thing that did during COVID, which is everything that doesn't fit the narrative is misinformation or disinformation or uh, not correctly contextualized information or however they want to say it. And they're going to try to shut down these channels of communication again. And they're probably going to invent new FUD vectors for Bitcoin. So what I wanted to ask you about is what do you see as the next kind of big FUD attack vector for Bitcoin. Cause I think the criminal narrative is kind of dying out. Like there's just yeah, too yeah. much evidence to show that like, look, you're, you're fucking lying. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little portion of the network. And the U S dollar is the, the chosen currency of criminals. Like, okay, shut up. Yeah. The burning the planet thing. It's like, look, it, there's now too much evidence that Bitcoin is actually going to be a net positive for grid stability and for methane capture and for building out renewable infrastructure. Like, so like, but they got to find something else. So like, what do you think we're going to evolve in terms of what's this next FUD cycle going to look like? Oh, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's very obvious that uh, inequality is, is a, going to be a popular rallying cry for the, you know, Bitcoin wealth, which is like, you know, these guys, they fucking, uh, all they did was buy digital coins and sit on their ass and fucking, they were so rude and mean the whole time. And they just shot spitballs from the back of the class. And it's like, they, they don't, you know, ev like I said earlier, everybody wants to see you lose. Nobody wants to see you win. So anything they can use to try and, uh, you know, expropriate wealth from you, they're, they're going to use. And it wouldn't surprise me to see potentially, you know, I, I mean, all, just all manner of things. Like like one one thing would be, um, this isn't attack vector as well as the ETFs, I think. And, and the reason why is because, once you have a like kind, uh, you know, ETF structure, you can then put Bitcoin into an ETF structure without creating a taxable event, and you will have the ability to margin against it, which is incredibly. I mean, if you want to talk about a carrot and stick approach, the the stick is if you have raw Bitcoin, spot Bitcoin, we're going to audit the fuck out of you, and we're going to make you responsible for these new FATFA guidelines. Okay, that's the stick. The carrot is. If you put your money in the nice, safe, friendly ETF, um, you can margin against it and you can run the buy, borrow, die strategy like Michael Saylor talks about. And you can buy your nice house and do your nice things and have a nice life. Oh, and we've just created the world's largest honeypot for Bitcoin that we now control and can nationalize whenever we feel like it. So... Yeah. You know, which, which way, Western man? Like, which, <laughs> which way are you going to go? You know? Uh, I could see them doing some sort of like a, a windfall, you know, like the idea of the windfall tax or like that, a wealth tax, specific e exactly. to Bitcoin. just carbon for credit, Bitcoin, carbon credit tax could be a thing uh, right. specific to Bitcoin. You know, I, I think that, I think the carbon credit one is going to be harder, harder to push through because there's just too much evidence that like Bitcoin actually has a net positive effect yeah. in terms of what, like the, the data is not in their favor there. But a windfall tax is something that they can, that's not, data has nothing to do with it. That's just emotion, right? It's just saying, like you said, yeah. look at these, Inequality. these Bitcoiners. Yeah. yeah. Oh, how, they don't deserve aren't you it. mad at them? They didn't earn it, you know, all that shit, you know? Yeah. You know, only those of us who've been here, are, yeah, they don't, only those of us who've been here know how emotionally difficult, how, you know, financially difficult, how risky, how uh, just painful it was to go through this for long stretches of time. But at the end of the day, nobody will care about that. And they'll just see you as some rich guy who they can steal from, you know? Yeah. Fuck. It's, uh, I mean, the attack vector has to be emotional, right? It has to be yeah. something that they can, they can pull at and say, put, 
put up the other, you know, the, the, the nouveau wealth other and say, look at, look at, they, they don't deserve that. All they did was just hold this money and you've been holding this money. That's been losing value and it's our fault, but don't pay no attention to that. You know? And, uh, it's even, yeah. it's even worse for us than, than tech backlash was because at least the tech guys could say, you know, look at you guys, you all use, you all use Facebook and you all use Google and you all use the iPhone and you all use these things that we, that we created. Right. And so, you know, yeah, it's like, okay, yeah, there's an argument to be made that like, yeah, you deserve some money for that because we are all using these things. We're getting some value out of them or whatever. But with Bitcoin, like there are going to be people that have Bitcoin and people that don't have Bitcoin and people that don't have Bitcoin. By the way, there's only 21 million Bitcoin, right? Which is great for you if you hold Bitcoin, but really shitty if you don't hold Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, it is a hardcore enforcement mechanism, filtering mechanism for, you know, it's... it's <laughs> The 21 million cap is God's way of determining uh, who is smart and who is poor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so people are going to be upset and fuck them. You know what I mean? You weren't here. Why do you think you deserve anything? You don't deserve what we have. You know, and, Only we, and we are still, we are still early in this. You know, there is still a chance of you listening to this out there. If, if, you know, if there's somebody listening to this right now and you stumbled upon uh, this podcast, the Bitcoin podcast, a.k.a. Titcoin, a.k.a. another fucking Bitcoin podcast, uh, because I've put Bitcoin podcast so many times in the website and everything and just the SEO worked perfectly and you found your way here and you're listening to this and you don't have any Bitcoin yet. Uh, what what is what is your message to that person? Like, what do you wish you would have heard? And now, obviously, 10 years ago, it was a completely different. Uh, well, it was the same Bitcoin, but completely different. Uh, potential risk versus yeah. reward, a much higher spread there, right? Like yeah, yeah. a lot more risk, a lot more reward. Now that's sort of reaching a nice, an, a more palatable level for people. So like, what is your, you know, if you're talking to a, a friend or you're talking to the, the pre coiner who is listening to this show, what, what do you say to them to be, to, to invite them into the Bitcoin fold? Yeah. Or, or, I, you know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I have a friend who's a green beret. And he's talked to me at length about um, disasterness uh, preparing, you know, and, and just being ready in the event uh, things go things go haywire. Um, Green Bray is also trained in asymmetric warfare, right? So yeah, and they're they're CIA backed assets. So like this guy, very smart, knows a lot of things. Um, and he basically told me this phrase, which is "go ugly early." Okay, so. The first minute you hear about Bitcoin and you get that sort of thought in your head that says, maybe I should do something about this. That's the time to start packing your lunch, eating rice and beans, selling your car, buying as much Bitcoin as you can possibly get your fucking hands on. Uh, you know what I mean? Taking extra jobs, driving Uber, doing whatever it fucking takes to get your hands on as much Bitcoin as you can. I think it's important to act with haste early on, like extremely early. Do not wait. Do not tiptoe your way in. Like go balls deep, okay? Uh, when when you look at lump sum versus dollar cost averaging, lump sum outperforms dollar cost averaging ninety five percent of the time, right? Um, there's only five percent of the time when it's a bad idea to lump sum, and usually those come around really frothy times in the Bitcoin market. So today it's March fourth. My advice is still good today, okay? Um, if it's you know uh, March fourth, two thousand twenty five, and the price is three hundred thousand dollars. Maybe my advice is, is no good and you should, you should wait a while. But I think right now, if you're listening right now, March 4th, 2024, go ugly fucking early, man. If you're new here, just start stacking your heart out. Like, get as much Bitcoin as you fucking can. This thing is a runaway freight train and you're not going to be able to catch it. Like, I, I bet it's, it's true for me. I bet it's true for Walker that, like, when we first got here, I should have gone so much harder. And I did go hard, but I didn't go as hard as I fucking should have. I should have gone 10 times harder. Become a crazy person. If people in your life are not showing you active disdain, you're not stacking hard enough. If you're still invited to family Thanksgiving, you're not stacking hard enough. If people are not making fun of you for brown bagging your lunch, you're not stacking hard enough. If your car is younger than Bitcoin, you're not stacking hard enough. Okay? You're, if you don't have a second job, you're not stacking hard enough. If You're just not stacking hard enough. If nobody has called you a retard, you're not stacking hard enough. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's good advice and you are absolutely right. Cause I wish I, I was already what I thought was going hard. And then I realized that that, that was not, uh, and I could have right. been so, so much more aggressive. And I think 
there's a, we're still at this very interesting, uh, in this limbo period right now, I think where right now, like, okay, if you're, especially if you're, if you're a younger person, like if you're, if, if you are, uh, under the age of, you know, 45, let's say, I don't know. That's just an arbitrary. If, if you are not a boomer, let's say I'll just, I'll no offense boomers, but I'm just going to put the line right there. If you're not a boomer and you have watched the boomer class accumulate an obscene amount of wealth because they lived through the easiest money fiat expansionary time in history. And you could be dumb as a box of fucking rocks and get rich. And you feel that that fucking kind of sucks for you because you missed out on that. And maybe you came into the workforce right after fucking 08 or something, or you're maybe you're fucking, you were born in the year 2000 and you're 24 now, uh, which is just wild, uh, to think about, but you know, maybe you're 24 and you're thinking, how am I ever going to, to get ahead and to catch up right now? You still have that opportunity because right now the boomer class, the, if they've got let's say they want to make a million dollar smash buy of Bitcoin. They can buy a million dollars of Bitcoin right now. That will give them more Bitcoin than like 99% of the 80 IQ plebs on Bitcoin Twitter. Just, and, and they'll just have it and they'll appreciate all of this incredible upside that we're about to have. And that kind of seems like, it's like, damn, okay, that's a little rough. Like these boomers can just out, outbid the rest of us plebs still, but that's not going to last for long. There will be a point soon where those multimillionaire boomers, even if they smash by a million dollars, that's not going to get them very much Bitcoin anymore. You can get a lot of Bitcoin right now for a lot less than a million dollars. And you can do that a few sats at a time. But there will come a point where in like you doesn't matter if you've got a few million dollars that are just, I don't know, sitting to burn from because you just sold your eighth vacation house that's not going to get you very much Bitcoin and that time is coming soon. And so that's, that's the way I've been trying to think about it and frame it lately, because there is going to be a massive wealth transfer that happens and some of it's already happening, but there's still a little bit of a grace period where, I mean, if you, heck, if you're a boomer listening to this and you've got a million dollars lying around, you might want to get on it because you're going to start getting, even you will get priced out of uh, cheap sats pretty soon. But mm. we're still at this sweet spot time, I think. Like we're we're still uh, we're still at a rounding error level, I think, yeah. which is kind of wild to think about. I said this the other day, and uh, I think it's an interesting way to frame it. Which is, you know, when I first started buying Bitcoin, it was uh, Christmas of 2014. Uh, so the price was around two hundred dollars a Bitcoin, and you know, nowadays uh, the the price could have moved two hundred dollars a hundred times while we were having this conversation, and it it didn't affect me at all, right? Like I, I don't even think about it when it when I see it move two hundred bucks, it's neither here nor there. And at sixty seven thousand dollars right now, like Bitcoin seems expensive, but when Bitcoin moves up two orders of magnitude, are do you really believe it's going to seem expensive to you when you look at your portfolio? Let's say you have a single Bitcoin, and the difference is. 2.62 million versus 2.68 million. No, you're just going to look at it and see 2.6. Still doing good. Still 2.6, right? That's how you're going to think. I know that's like hard to wrap your mind around now, but that's the future that set it for you. And I know that future because I've lived it. Okay. I'm from the, I'm from the future. Goddamn. No, it's like, I, I lived that over the last 10 years, you know, and it's, it's been weird. Yeah. It's always weird when you're, your wealth moves up two orders, three orders of magnitude. It's strange. Yeah. These, uh, I mean, everything is relative, right? And it seems again, and I suppose if, if you're just dipping your toes in now, like I, I think the, the, the Bitcoin class that has just been hardened by this last bear market is, is going to be pretty resilient because you've got a, uh, I don't know how it felt compared to previous ones. Like, again, this was my first bear market. And maybe I'm just thinking that this class of Bitcoiners is, is somehow special. Uh, but boy, it, it felt fairly brutal at times. Like when it was getting down into the depths of like 16K and people were like, well, could go to could go lower, could go to 12, could go yep. to 10, could go to five. But it didn't. Um, and then it just slowly not actually not even that slowly. It just started chugging along, chugging up. And like, it's wild how that just 
changes your perspective on things. I, I, I think like Bitcoin in general is such a, it, well, it's an ego killer uh, and it's a, a perspective, like it's a, it's a psychedelic drug for your perspective because it is going to completely reshape how you think about how you think about time, how you think about money and how you think about, I guess, just what it means to, to actually save for your future. That's, I think that this millennial gen Z generation has grown up thinking there's just no way you can get ahead. So like, what's the fucking point of saving for your future? Right. We've been gifted this beautiful fucking piece of monetary technology when we happen to be alive and young and agile enough of mind to take advantage of it. Like shame on us if we do not, because it, like you said earlier, it's like, wow, here we are, all our ancestors fucking and fighting and killing and dying throughout all of history. And here we sit today talking across these crazy internet computer screens and we've got this magic internet money and we just have to be open to learn about it. And I don't know. I, I, I hope I'm curious to see what Gen Z's uh, role in this ends up being because they don't have the most purchasing power now, but they're going to, especially if they stack Bitcoin. And that's going to also change a lot of the, like <laughs> how much of the woke mind virus, if you want to call it that is, is just comes down to our money breaks down, our society breaks down, our morals break down, our time preference gets higher, higher, higher. And everything goes to shit from that. Like I'm, yeah. I'm curious to see the shifts we see in society and in people when more and more start having their perspective shifted by Bitcoin. Yeah. 100%. I also think that, you know, people say uh, it used to be more popular in like 2015, 2016 to say, what's Bitcoin's killer app? I don't see it. I don't get it. What's the killer app? You know, and it's like the killer app is getting fucking rich. Are you stupid? That's the killer app. What is the one thing everybody wants? A more prosperous life. Okay. And so like to me, the interesting unlock is Bitcoin is going to free the vast majority of hodlers of their time constraints. So they will no longer have to be selling time for money. So that's an unlock. And then it's going to give them excess capital and they're going to have to deploy that excess capital back into the marketplace. So that's an unlock, right? And then, you know, we all know each other and we know that we have similar moral frameworks and values. So that's an unlock because we don't have to, you know, you get a couple of Bitcoiners in a room talking to a non-Bitcoiner we don't have to pre-communicate. We're, we're all going to say the same things. Like we know what the person, we know what needs to be said next. Like the, the ability to set the ball to each other, uh, you know, and spike it perfectly down the no corners throat is just a thing of beauty. And it's going to be the same thing in capital formation because we're all operating with this new OS in our minds. Right. And so to me, you look at those three unlocks of like giving back the time, giving excess capital and then creating better capital formation structures due to shared values, morals, ideology, um, you're going to get a renaissance of just amazing things that Bitcoiners will do with their wealth, right? And yeah, if you want to be a part of that story, then all you have to do is buy Bitcoin. That, that's it. It's, it's, it's the simplest thing in the world. So like, it, you can either be a part of that story or you can be the part of the story where they want you to live in a pod, eat bugs, uh, get an allotment for driving time, um, you know what I mean? Like never have sex with a human woman, like jerk off into some sort of weird robot. Like that's what they want for you. They want the worst life imaginable. They want you to live like a slave. Uh, they don't care. These people, they don't care if you live or die. I, I care about you because I, I need your capital invested in this thing I'm going to do later. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like they, they don't, you're nothing to them. You're a bug, you know? It, it's it's honestly so true. I, I don't I don't understand the mentality of people who somehow uh, think that the the state has their best interests at heart. Like that they think that the government. You know, if we just give the government a little bit more of our money, aka our our lifeblood, our time and energy, because that's what the government is, right? It's a time thief. Like you know, if you get thirty three percent tax a year, let's just say that's a third of third of your life. They're stealing a third of your working life just for, for what, like to, what are they giving you that you cannot give yourself? Nothing. And it, it's, it's fucking insane. And I'm curious, you know, what, okay, let's, uh, 
let's let, let's let's zoom forward a little. What do you, what do you think? And this is a tough one, but let's let's think in like four year cycles. Like what what is uh the next the next Bitcoin cycle? So the you know we're looking at like twenty twenty eight. You know, there's another presidential election, of course. You know, every four, every leap year, every presidential election, every Bitcoin having cycle, they're all falling in the same year. What is what does that world start to look like, and how uh, how rapidly do we start to see these larger changes? Do we start to see governments actually shrink because more and more people realize they need to hold governments to account? Like, do we start to see that bureaucratic state? get a little bit smaller to, for people to get a little bit freer, or is this something that's going to take again, because humans are bad at estimating rate of change. Is it something that's going to take a lot longer than we think? It's going to take a lot longer than we think a lot longer. I, I think basically what you have is a war going on between new money and old money, right? A little bit between East coast and West coast with the tech elites and the traditional elites, but really new money, old money, like USD millionaires versus Bitcoiners. Uh, which we are more aligned with in terms of the West Coast uh, tech elites than we are with the East Coast traditionalists. Um, but basically, it's like when new money and old money go to war with each other, they're going to war with each other over uh, rulemaking, right? And so when whenever you have a revolution, the best you can do is get about half the seats at the table of power, right? And when you come to the table of power, you get a chance to negotiate and do rulemaking, when you have an unsuccessful negotiate or an unsuccess, unsuccessful revolution, you're you're getting like a couple seats at the table, not enough to do anything. I think we're going to get enough seats to make meaningful change. Um, that's how big I think this revolution is, and those are the best revolutions in history. But it's not going to be every seat because the unfortunate reality is that you know fiat wealth can be easily ported into Bitcoin, and so if you're wealthy in the fiat system and you're not a total moron, at some point as this thing you know crosses the Rubicon you're going to go, it's time to jump ship, and you're going to maintain your position in society and your seat. Um, and when we come to do rulemaking with the old elites, we're basically going to have to bargain. And the bargain is, we're coming with a fair, distributed, computer-enforced, uh, rules-based system for everybody. And you can't change the rules of the game any longer midstream. The rules are set at inception, and we play by the rules until their final conclusion. That is what we're bringing to the table, and we would like to see that in as many institutions as we possibly can, okay? Your way of doing things where, you know, you, you change the rules constantly for your own benefit, and it's only the people at the table who are receiving benefit from those rule changes, that's over. We want a meritocratic system where the strongest survives, and we need a fair rules-based order in order to get that system. And I think that that's going to be an unpopular ask, but it's a fair ask, and over time that ask will win between the elites, and we'll have a new class of elites, a better class of elites, and some of them will be Bitcoiners. Most of them will be Bitcoiners. Yeah, I like. I mean, I, I think it's fair, and that is, like, it kind of goes back to what I was hinting at before, with just like the the boomer millionaires right now. They can uh, they can port over a big old chunk of wealth and become more Bitcoin rich than the majority of Bitcoiners right now, who have been right. working hard and stacking sats just because. Again, they've they're starting from a, a higher bucket of fiat that they can they can dip out of, but I I have the hope that at least uh, some of this incredibly uh, diverse but ultimately morally aligned Bitcoin culture starts to bleed into other parts of society because like I truly do think that with money as the base layer, like you you look across history. Uh, you, you can look at the French Revolution. Like, why why was there a French Revolution? Like, why did they not have food? And why did they start, you know, uh, chopping people's heads off? Well, it's because they started uh, they started inflating the assignat or as assignat, uh, however you'd like to pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> they they started inflating it, and they started doing all sorts of funny business, and the value of it dropped and dropped and dropped, and then it bought jack shit, and then people started starving, and then people got mad, and society just fell apart. And then they had to start over again. The French are pretty good at starting over again after a monetary collapse, though. Uh, they've got some practice at it now. But I, I'm I'm interested to see because a lot of us Bitcoiners, and I'll, I, I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, like I'm, I think sometimes it seems as though we're calling for the fall of the USD. Like which 
I am in no way doing as much as I may shit on the U S dollar as the, uh, very kind of corrupt global reserve currency that funds a whole lot of atrocities around the world. Uh, I do not want the USD to just fail because that's going to hurt a fuckload of people. Like that's going to yeah. lead to a great amount yeah. of human suffering. I, I do not want human suffering. And the reality of the situation is that like, okay, if we talk about, you know, uh, the USD is going to hyperinflate as uh, many people said, it's going to hyperinflate, you know, like next year, or next year, next year. The reality is that if the U S U S dollar is hyperinflating, every other fiat currency in the world has probably already hyperinflated because the U S dollar is the prettiest horse at the glue factory, still at the glue factory, still about to be made into glue, but it's the prettiest horse there. So it's going to get saved for last, most likely, unless there's some event that causes that to change. But I think that the, the U S is also uniquely positioned to be able to benefit if we're smart, if, and I say we, as like our political class, if we're smart, we have the highest Bitcoin hash rate in the world right now. We've got a shitload of Bitcoin that we've taken from, uh, from, you know, hacks and things like that. We're in a position to, if we play this smart to do very well as the United States, I don't know if we're smart though. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we have the capacity to be intelligent about this and say, wow, we should be encouraging more miners to come into Texas and to Georgia and to New York state. And we should be, we should get that hash rate as high as it can possibly get. Cause that's hash rate that our enemies don't have. <laughs> Do you think there's any chance? I mean, we see between like, and I don't even, I, I don't love to talk about, uh, you know, the red and blue, uh, too much. Cause I find myself firmly to be in the orange camp between Trump and Biden. I don't see a massive difference. Um, you know, they both had Jerome Powell printing money on their behalf. Biden, uh, to, well, not to his credit, cause he doesn't know what the fuck's going on, but Hey, M2 shrank a little bit. Whoopie fucking do. You've got RFK coming into the race. Uh, RFK now has just been like, well, you know, actually I like Ethereum too. And I'll be buying some Ethereum and it's like, ah, fuck. Okay. Well, shit yeah. there, there that goes. So you were just, you know, I don't know, take it for what it's worth. But <laughs> do you, th I, I don't know how much the presidency actually matters. I think that uh, I was talking, Mark Moss, I made some very good points in this recently, like localism matters a lot more. Counties matter a lot more. States matter a lot more. That's the whole fucking point of the U S do you, do you personally give a shit about who wins the presidential election and think it matters very much? Or are you trying to focus more at a local level at a community level uh, about things you can actually change? Like what's, what's your, your take on that? Yeah. I mean, um, it, it's like poli politics are fucking getting worse and worse ever since our society lost religion. Uh, everyone has a God shaped hole in their heart and some large majority of the population is filling it with politics for some fucking reason. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think the presidency matters to your, to your life very much at all. Right. <laughs> Um, if there, if I had the choice between a very pro Bitcoin candidate and a very anti Bitcoin candidate, I'd take the pro Bitcoin candidate. If I had a choice between two pro Bitcoin candidates, I'd take the one I believed more. Um, although it's hard to believe any of them, uh, in terms of localism, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a good philosophy and you should be involved in your local community and, you know, but I, I think the most important thing is just focusing on what you, what you can control, you know? don't focus on things outside your control or, or you're going to be miserable all the time. You know, um, I can't, I, there's a, there's an, a goddamn invasion happening at the Southern border. It should be obvious to everybody. Uh, you know, but I can't do anything about that. When am I going to go down to the Southern border and be like, Hey, Hey, stop. Hold it right there. Hombres. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, you know, and like, <laughs> yeah, politics are fucking stupid, you know? Yeah. There's nothing else to say about it other than it's, yeah. it's dumb. Although Bitcoin is inherently political, you know, unfortunately. That that doesn't mean left-right political. It just means entrenched power structure versus ascendant power structure. Um, on, on the topic of, like, you know, American supremacy and dominance, I mean, in, in terms of the dollar, in terms of our culture, in terms of society, it's like there's there are still so many great things about America – mainly that were given to us by uh, the leaders we had 300 years ago and not the leaders that currently reside in any of the high perches of power. 
but we still have freedom of speech, which allows us to be sort of the guardians of the internet in a very interesting way. Like none of the, none of the rest of the English speaking world has the ability to say what the fuck they want to say. And we can still say it. Now you might get killed for it, but we can still say it. God damn it. And if they are going to take freedom of speech, then the only logical conclusion is to use your freedom of speech as hard as fucking possible right up until the moment it's taken away from you. So we have that going for us. We have our geography going for us. America is very unique geographically. And when I look at like, I mean, listen, I want to, I want to live in a world of sort of xenophilic restrictionism or isolationism where we just, we only care about ourselves and we're kind of inwardly focused, but that's not the way the world actually works. And, and when I look at like, would I rather have China running things or America running things as bad as America is, I'd still rather have America running things. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that the next generation of American leadership can be smart and can, you know, learn from the mistakes of the past, uh, and actually like, you know, accomplish something. I think that the Chinese are supremacist in a way that's, uh, <laughs> as somebody who's not, uh, Chinese and the, you know, I forget which, which kind of Chinese is the best kind of Chinese, but they're supremacist about one kind of Chinese and not the other. I, I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> do you do you remember what it is? I'm bad at geopolitics. Between America and the Chinese, like who's going to have control of the world? Uh, personally, I would rather America with our founding documents have control of the world, even though we're not living up to our founding documents, obviously. It, it's Yeah, it's like, uh, is America the, like, is America the best that it can be? Like, absolutely not. But we have the potential to be there's a, a very limiting factor on how good a totalitarian regime can be. And, you know, you were, uh, you were talking a little bit just about freedom of speech and I, that freedom of speech is one of those things that we really take for granted in America. Um, and one could make the argument to what extent it is those, that freedom has already been eroded with just what we saw during COVID and what you see about any, depending on what side of an issue you're on, uh, you can very easily get censored and blocked and, this is one of those reasons uh, I am very grateful Noster exists, uh, which is still very small right now. You've been extremely active on Noster, though, for a, a long time. And I think you and I share similar sentiments there. But I'm curious, do you think we start to, uh, with this, with the election year, with uh, maybe there's a little bit of Bitcoin bull run bleed over that happens and we get a little bit of a Noster uh, a new entrance bull run, do you think we start to see that ramp up? Like is Noster adoption a function of uh, free speech fuckery, much like Bitcoin adoption is somewhat a function of monetary fuckery in the fiat world? Mm. It's in, yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the, I'm not sure. I, I think the most interesting thing about Noster so far is that it hasn't become a noxious right wing echo chamber or a noxious left wing echo chamber. So Threads is a noxious left-wing echo chamber. Um, so is Farcaster, I think. Although I haven't spent much time there, but I hear that I hear that's what it is. And then you know, uh, n n Twitter seems to be kind of leaning into becoming a noxious right-wing echo chamber these days. And Gab and stuff like that has definitely been that. Truth Social, uh, if you go in for that kind of thing, Truth Social just seems like you know. A thousand FBI agents and six guys in Des Moines that don't know everyone else is a thousand FBI agents, you know? <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, Truth Social is a wild one. Like, I, yeah, I, know. I, I guess people's, I mean, some people use it. Um, it seems just like it's just like a Trump campaign app, basically, again, with a bunch of FBI yeah. agents on there. Uh, but, <laughs> but not, yeah, Noster, I think, is really interesting in the sense that it still has a very good culture. Um, it's very, you know, I don't know. It's like it's hard to opine on the future of Noster. I just, to me personally, I find it very useful. I think there's a lot of really cool people that I really enjoy, you know, interacting with on there, and that's why I'm on there. And I, I'm enjoying the algorithm-free experience. I, th I think that's the number one thing that differentiates it from everything else. And of course, this is not to get into all the Noster as a protocol stuff, which you know is, is a whole other Pandora's box can of worms, right? But like. Just the way we experience Nostra today is like sort of a Twitter clone. It's interesting in the sense that it has no algorithmic uh, sorting function. And it's almost like the algorithm is the thing 
you, you know when you stick a you know you you stick a amplifier you, you, the guitar into the other end of the amplifier and it creates that negative feedback loop and then you get you get that that awful noise that happens that screeching it's almost like the rest of social media is that you know and Noster is like a breath of fresh air yeah it's it's incredible how much you can influence behavior with algorithms right and you see this on Twitter like in the quality of information that you get where it's no uh, it's not really people trying to post the most high value or high quality information there it's people trying to do whatever they can to game the algorithm so that they get the most exposure because the incentives are structured as such where the more exposure you get uh if you're a you know a, a premium verified you're going to get the most uh potential ad ad revenue sharing from it and so everybody is just trying to game it's why you see like i think that like ai twitter is the most key example of this where it's just like like i'm pretty sure like 50 dudes who are just all posting the exact same ai threads like you know, open ai just dropped sora here are five of the latest videos you won't believe yeah. are real and it's like and you see that just over and over and over and over again and it's like you know they're getting like millions of impressions and it's like all right and you guys are all posting the same thing and it's not really high value and it most of it is just recycled old content and it it's nice that on Noster you there's no incentive to do that you're just going to look like a a human bot and nobody's going to want to interact with you like you're incentivized to be authentic and i think that's a that's a good incentive to have it's authenticity is something we need a little bit more of i'm curious to see if the gov like right now it's very much still so small that i don't think anybody's really paying attention to it which is nice like you know fly under the radar as long as you need to but i'm curious if like this election cycle you know somebody starts posting their their hot takes about election conspiracy theories on noster and then the government's like well we might have to do something about this protocol yeah. like I does don't know. uh does snowden follow you on noster i think he does which is just wild yeah, so uh, me, me too. So the CIA has already got us on their list, you know. Shit. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot, Ed. No, but, but it, like that's the incredible thing is that you can be on there and a guy like Snowden can follow you and you can interact with him and have an actual conversation. Like that's fucking insane. Like, wow. Like that. I mean, yeah, we are. Fu fuck. We are on some lists now, aren't we? Well, shit. You know, what are you going to do, though? I was probably on some lists already. I'm sure you were as well. Uh, <laughs> so. You know what's interesting about the algorithm I was thinking about while you were talking about it is do you – so I've been cursed with a long memory. And I remember in the early days of Facebook when, you know, it went from being a thing we used in college to post a photo of us doing a bong hit to being a thing that suddenly your Aunt Becky was like, why is there a photo of you smoking a bong on here? Right? Um, and, and then what, what did Aunt Becky do when she first got Facebook? She was like – Making a tuna salad, you know, or that like going to the movies, right? Like that was those were the status updates. And then as the algorithm kicked into full gear and, and time moved on, 13 years later, Aunt Becky's like, you're a fascist, rapist, pedophile, <laughs> fuck you. And you're like, what? What can you make? Can you go back to making tuna salads, bitch? Like, what are you doing? You know, Dude, it, it is wild. Like Facebook very much transitioned from this kind of perhaps boring but very benign uh platform to it's basically like now where boomers go to yell at each other about their political beliefs yeah like, like that's a set like it's where it's where boomers go to ruin old like yes. decades long friendships yeah. like carol you, i know yeah. you're my friend of 30 years but if you don't stop supporting donald j trump right now i am going to unfriend you <laughs> that's what that's they like do. it's literally <laughs> and it's like it's kind of so sad it's like Boy, you you start to realize the the boomer class was not really uh, yeah they weren't really equipped to handle that kind of accessibility no. to each other. No, like they, you know, no. you almost feel bad. The boomers almost. only do two things: vacuum really loudly while listening to Fox News at full volume or MSNBC, uh, and then two scream at each other on Facebook. That's that's all they do. You know, yeah, uh, man. God God bless them though. God We're all shaped it. by the media environments that we grew up in, right? Like your grandchildren would be like, you don't even fuck holograms? What are you, gay? And you're just like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? What does that mean? No, I'm I don't confused. Do <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little weird. Is there like a static buildup that happens with that? How does that work? 
So, yeah, I mean, you know, but it's interesting because, like, the changeover for the boomers, I think, was much more um, profound. And, and, you know, it's just something that they can't. It, I'm, I'm actually impressed when I meet boomers who are into Bitcoin. I, I'm very impressed by that. Same. You know, because it's, it's extremely difficult. And I don't know if I was them, I, w I would have the same uh, ability to change my mind and stay young in spirit and thoughtfulness. I, you know, Gary Leland, I was talking to Gary, Le yeah. Gary Leland, and he told me that every day he just like will brush his teeth with the wrong hand or put his socks on different or like, you know what I mean? Wear, put on his t-shirt, then his socks, then his pants. Like he just does everything different every day to create like uh, higher levels of neuroplasticity. So that he stays young in his mind. And I was like, you know what? That comes through when I'm talking to you. So maybe that's a good thing that we should all do. We should all take that page from Gary Leland. You know, Dude, dude I love that. Gary's a great dude. Same thing. Mad respect to the boomer Bitcoiners. Because that, yeah. that is like, talk about teaching an old dog new tricks. Like that's impressive. And it, again, requires a huge level of humility and willingness to learn. Like you, you, you're not a digital native. You've seen a heck of a lot, you know, you've lived two of our lifetimes already. And if you're open to Bitcoin after all that, and after like, you probably had a pretty good place in the existing power structure, but you decided to take a chance on something that seemed fucking weird. And it can guarantee the boomer uh, that any boomer Bitcoiners, their boomer friends give them so much more shit than a millennial or Gen Z Bitcoiners friends give them. I'm like sure. the boomer friends are like, yeah. yeah like I'm worried that you're, you know, you're, you're going senile, like you're, you're losing it, you know, with this, these bitty coins, like more power to them. It's fucking impressive. It is impressive. Yeah. I, I mean, I, sometimes I go off on boomers, uh, you know, and I, I think they think I'm talking about them, but I'm not talking about the Bitcoiners. Yeah. Just, yeah. just the regular boomers, you know? Yeah. The, 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 we, yeah, we gotta, we gotta differentiate like the boomers with a regular B versus the Unicode Bitcoin B. Like we yes. should, we should give them that special designation just to, exactly. so that they're not exactly. offended. Although, well, even though I like you guys, I'm not going to Applebee's with you anytime soon. All right. I'm sorry. I'm just not going. I don't go to I, Applebee's. All how, right. I know that? you guys love it. I'm not going. Are, are there, I can't imagine Applebee's is doing great these days. Are they, are they are, like, are they, is that still like a, I don't remember the last time I, I heard about anybody being like, you know what? I think we'll, uh, we'll go to the Applebee's Diane. All or, I know I is that know the what boomers the is. love Applebee's. They only love two things in this world, Donald Trump and Applebee's. That's it. There's nothing what, else. What a beautifully simple existence, though, huh? Like, <laughs> it's kind of zen. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, it's funny. I envy the, you know, I think that, here's one thing I'll say that's really positive about the boomers. I think that the boomers are a vanguard in our society that when they're gone, we're going to miss them because p young people are, deranged truly truly like uh even guys like us we're deranged we're like internet money podcast guys that's a weird thing to be man that's weird you know like there's not just like normal people walking around anymore there used to just be normal boomers oh, just fuck walking down, around again. every day doing boomer stuff <laughs> like now what do they do i don't know we're we're just every every Shit, millennial is like low key mentally ill, like <laughs> AOC is low key mentally ill for sure, one hundred percent. You know, oh, uh, what's it going to be like? We have millennial politicians who believe things like white privilege is real. That's not real, man. It's uh, never been real. What are you talking about? It's worrisome about. I mean, fuck, like not even millennial, but like the Gen Z political class. That's going to be a, a terrifying one. But again, this is where I hope that, like, like I think the pendulums swing, right? It's what fucking pendulums do. And sometimes when, like, when they swing back, they swing back hard. Uh, and I have to imagine. I think we're already seeing some of this. There's there's a pushback against some of this general insanity out there that this younger generation has been fed. I mean, they've been fed by the older generation. Like, let's not absolve the older generation of this. They're the, the power class right now that's pushing a lot of these narratives. Yeah. And they're being picked up by this, by this younger generation. Um, and it's, what does it come down to? It's a means of control and distraction, right? It, to distract you from, it's to, to give you a problem to look at that you are told is the cause of all your woes. When in reality, that problem has nothing to do with your woes at all. The problem is far, far deeper than that. And you're being, having the truth obfuscated from you 
because that truth is inconvenient. And that's that things are so much more fundamentally broken than you realize. And anything that they tell you that's going to fix your little tiny perceived problem is not at all. Your, your problem is a symptom of a much deeper disease. And you can either, you can either treat the symptom, which is fine, but you're just going to have more symptoms or you can cure the fucking disease. Yeah. And I think that's what Bitcoiners have come around to is we got to cure the fucking disease. And it's a boy, it's a fucking bitch though, isn't it? It's a, <laughs> it's a nasty disease. This, oh yeah, the, this the fiat woke, degradation. I think the woke mind virus in particular is something that uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to get rid of very easily. There's a lot of people out there who believe really stupid communist bullshit, and they walk amongst us. Unfortunately, um, we have more communists in this country than we ever had before, ever. Um, I think the internet is going around creating communists as well. It's it's weird. It's like I I was I was mulling over this the other day. I'd love I'd get love to get your take on this. Is like I was trying to figure out if the tool the internet has been a tool of uh, individualization or collectivization, and I couldn't come to a solid conclusion on that because I see a lot more tribal behavior. Um, it used to be that we were all like in these big tribes, right? Like, and then they splintered. They shattered into a million pieces. And now there's all these little disparate tribes, right? But I don't really consider most of the people in those to be individuals. You know, I think, I think even Bitcoin is sort of a sovereign tribe and less of a sovereign individual thesis, especially like newer Bitcoiners, not to pick on your class, but like there's, it's, it's a lot easier to become a Bitcoiner these days because you can read a couple books and listen to a couple podcasts and get the general message. It used to be that we had to like Bitcoin in the dark, which was, you know, you were Bitcoining, uh, reading weird forum posts from schizophrenic people trying to figure out if they were right or not, you know, and like, is this guy a government agent or is he making sense macroeconomically? You know, like that was, it was a harder road to walk. And so you had to be more individually minded to walk it. And now it's a lot easier to join the orange tribe and be like, you know, I like me too, man. I like stacking Bitcoin. Fuck Hillary Clinton, dude. You know, and you're like, okay, that's cool. But do you have your own thoughts or anything? You know, I, I, I completely agree. Like it is much, much easier to jump on the, the Bitcoin train now. I mean, it's, you know, yeah, the, it's very easy. I think for new entrants to look back and say, oh, those guys that got in and 2015, 2014, 2013, whatever. Oh, they're so, you know, so lucky. Like if only I had done that, it's like, well, you wouldn't have, um, right. You just wouldn't have, like I heard about Bitcoin in 2014 when a buddy was getting some stuff off the, off the silk road. And he was like, have you heard of this Bitcoin thing? I'm like, no, I haven't. And I don't want to, you fucking nerd. Um, and then, you know, ignored it for multiple more years until 2017 when I ignored it again and uh, decided to uh, to buy one Litecoin because I couldn't afford a full Bitcoin. Uh, a <laughs> fucking idiot. And then, you know, finally 2020 came around again. And I was like, ah, okay, this time maybe I should pay attention and maybe I should actually educate myself. But come 2020, there were a lot more fucking educational resources out there. There's, It's a lot easier to get into it now, but there's also less of an excuse for you not to. Because you yes, do have a wealth too. of information at your fingertips. You, you've got, I mean, you've got this among many, many other fucking Bitcoin podcasts. For one, you've got all sorts of books. You've got conferences you can attend, meetups you can attend everywhere. Like it's a pretty incredible infrastructure that's being built out to give you on ramps to Bitcoin, and those did not exist a decade ago. And so, you know, it's a, uh, it's easy to look back and say, yeah, I would, I would have, I would have bought Bitcoin and then now I would be rich, but y you wouldn't have. Um, and if you did, you probably would have sold it to shitcoin uh, during the ICO boom. And then you would have lost it all and gone away for a while and then come back again. And so you're here now, my fellow pleb. And that's, that's what matters, you know, and <laughs> don't take that chance for granted though, because I would just you say, don't want to yeah, come back just, in four more years. I would just say, have your own thoughts and opinions, you know, just because you feel like uh, you'll be part of the tribe if you parrot somebody else's thoughts and opinions. Just try try your best not to do that. You know, it's okay to like disagree and uh, differ. You know, you don't have to eat nothing but meat, or you don't have to like hate modern art. You can like it. You know, <laughs> I, I don't like it, but you can like it. You know, it's fine. 
Bo- uh, both of those felt like they were directed at Safe Adine. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I love I love Safe, but th- me too, those are me too. those are Safe's authentic opinions. That's yes. Safe, right? Yes. Like Safe is like that. He he's really that guy, one hundred percent. But there's yeah. a bunch of guys who try and pretend like they're like Safe, and it's like, did you did you just get this opinion? Have you always had this opinion? Did you just come to this opinion? You know what I mean? It's like, just think yeah. for yourself. That's If you think for yourself and you come up to the same conclusions, that's fine. Just know how you're arriving at the conclusions. Don't leave one group to join a different group. The last thing Bitcoin needs is, is more people who think they're in a fucking group. You know? Do your own thing. Be an individual. Be a man. <laughs> the last thing I would say on that is just uh, make your own memes. Uh, don't, don't, don't be a derivative... Uh derivative meme stealer go go out there and craft your own memes build your own that's right build your own way you can make the next meme of this bull run uh, that can be you but uh you know i want to be uh i want to be conscious of your scarce time uh so before we end out uh last thing totally unrelated to anything else you reading anything right now bitcoin or not related that uh you'd recommend mm, what have, you, I you, read have you heard recently? of books you like those yeah, I was trying to think. Yeah. What have I read recently? Let me check my. Hold on, let me check my Audible list. I nice, um, nice. I've I've developed this habit where if something doesn't interest me immediately, I just stop reading it. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to think of where I'm at, like in terms of like things I actually stopped reading or where. What did I read? Oh, okay. Where are the customers' yachts? <laughs> uh, really, really good book about you know sort of efficient market hypothesis. Uh, I've been digging that one, which was recommended to me by the original Bitcoin maximalist himself, uh, Jun Seth. And then let's see what else I got. I haven't heard of that one. I'll have to check that out. Where are the customers' um, yachts? Where are the customers' yachts? Yep. Oh, and then Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. I just went through all of that recently. Um, probably the best book on Nazi Germany I've ever read. And the parallels between uh, today's time and pre uh, the pre the Nazification of Germany are just incredible. You know, I mean, uh, there's so much in there that like you'll have to go through it and read it. But there's just so much in there that we're seeing today. And I have to unfortunately believe it's going to give rise to something horrible, just like it did in, you know, pre Nazi Germany. Man, well, I appreciate that. Those are two uh, very. Uh, different end of the spectrum recommendations. So I, I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, but I'll, uh, I want to thank you again for coming on here. You know, Bitcoin is scarce, uh, but your time is also scarce and Bitcoin podcasts are quite abundant. So I want to thank you for coming on another <laughs> fucking Bitcoin podcast, sharing that scarce time with me. It's um, true. Uh, at American Hodel eight, I believe you say hodl, but we don't have to get into that right now. We don't have, we don't have time to get into that debate. Unfortunately. It's but uh, I'll drop your noster as well. Anywhere else you want to send people? Uh, no, man. Just fucking buy Bitcoin. Don't you don't have yeah. to go visit my Twitter? Just go buy Bitcoin. Yeah, but Fuck your Twitter's Twitter. pretty fire, though. That's why I would recommend <laughs> that they do it. Um. I listen. As fire as it is, uh, the Bitcoin will keep you warmer at night. You know what I mean? Get some Bitcoin. Oh, I mean, that's, that's the true. most important. That's the most important thing. Is just like make sure that you did the right things during this time period. Don't leave anything on the table. I've been going around, I'll ask you, I've been going around asking people um, if they had to give themselves a report card for the bear market, what would you give yourself? Hmm. I would give myself, uh, I'd say an A minus. Um, I, I, I was pretty pleased with how I, how I did. Uh, I stacked uh, quite relentlessly and really made sure I had as little fiat as possible in that checking account uh, at all times. Uh, however, there were also some purchases made, which were, were larger, some necessary, uh, but perhaps some not. Uh, I think I could have always done better. I'll give myself, I'll give myself an A minus verging on B plus, but I'm looking back, I do not think I will be disappointed with my stacking uh, because it was like, it, boy, it was a kick in the gut sometimes to try and stack at the as things were going down 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 and staying down for so long but now it feels pretty good to have stacked when things were way fucking down and like you're like wow it's fucking what what, what do we have right now at the 
at the time of recording, fiat price of Bitcoin, 67,492 cuck bucks. So yeah, uh, the, the, so the sats that I sniped at like 16 something thousand feel pretty fucking great right now. But yeah. I could always, I could always have done better. Uh, but I'm not going to lose sleep over it because I'm, I'm fairly proud. Yeah. Fuck and yeah. now fuck, thank God, because having a kid's fucking expensive. It so is. Like, yeah. Uh, less sats are being stacked now, but those sats <laughs> that I stacked during the bear market are, uh, that's for that little guy's future, you know, bro. Don't buy all the baby shit. Don't make the same mistake I made. You know what yeah. kids love? Kids love this. They love a water bottle. Just give them one of these empty water bottle hours of entertainment just let them crackle the sides a little bit they love crackling noises that's all right? they want to do there's one yeah. like, uh. <laughs> wild <laughs> to, to be a little human and be so fast it, it's, it's reminded me to be uh to be wide-eyed about things again you know to to look up and look around and be like wow that tree is fucking cool you know i know i know it's, it's a beautiful it's, thing it's great man it's the best and like yeah money spent on your family is not money that you're gonna regret you know amen yeah. Amen. Well, dude, thanks so much for coming on here. This was a, this was a fucking blast and, uh, looking course, forward man. to seeing you in the flesh, hopefully uh, a little later this year. Yeah. I'll probably be in Nashville if you're going to be there. Yeah. I'm going to be there. I'm going to bring the little guy too, I think. So, uh, should be a good time. Fun. All right. Well, I'll see you then, man. And we should do another one of these pods at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. I'm going to, I'm going to hold you to that. We'll, uh, we'll, yeah, of course it's a date. It's a date. All right. <laughs> take it easy. All right, man. brother. Peace. And that's a wrap on this Bitcoin Talk episode of The Bitcoin Podcast. If you are a Bitcoin-only company interested in sponsoring another fucking Bitcoin podcast, head to bitcoinpodcast.net or hit me up on social media. On Noster, head to primal.net slash walker. And on Twitter, search for at Walker America or at Titcoin Podcast. You can also watch the video version of this show on X or on YouTube by going to youtube.com slash at Walker America or rumble by searching for at Walker America. Bitcoin is scarce. There will only ever be 21 million, but Bitcoin podcasts are abundant. So thank you for spending your scarce time to listen to another fucking Bitcoin podcast. Until next time, stay free. <laughs>